Welcome to Exploring Computing. Today's video is Creating Web Pages, Responsive Web Design. So I've mentioned before that one of the key differences between working with web pages versus working with a printed page, and one of the reasons why you can't just take a word processor like Microsoft Word and generate a web page from it, I mean, technically you can, but it's not going to get you a very good web page, is that we don't have control over the output device when we're working with a web page. When we're working with a printed page, when we're working with Microsoft Word, we can say, oh, I'm going to print this out on an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper, or I'm going to print this out on a 17 by 11 sheet of paper. With the web browser, we don't have that sort of control. Our website says, hey, uh, this might be served up on a little cell phone. This might be served up on a big tablet. Um, this might be served on a huge desktop computer. It might be served on uh, somebody's HD television. So we have no control over the output device. And so what we need to do is we need to create web pages that will work for all of these different devices. And this is kind of a problem because the attractiveness of a web design and the utility is going to vary from one device size to another. So something that looks great on a cell phone is going to look really stupid on an HD television if you know, we just take our cell phone design and slap it up, up on the HD television. So that's not going to work very well. And in addition, there's various user interface or UI elements that work well on some devices, but not others. So one example of this would be tooltips. A lot of programs use tooltips and people started using tooltips for websites where you move the mouse on top of something, you let it sit there for a minute, and you get some information about that element. Well, that doesn't work with cell phones because you can't hover your finger over a particular element and have the cell phone realize you're doing that in order to bring up a tooltip. Similarly, you know, when you're working with your cell phone, you've got your finger, which is pretty big and fat compared to the sort of pointing device you can get if you've got either a mouse where you've got that nice little thin pointer or if you're working with something like say a uh, a pencil device like say an apple pencil uh, on, when you're working on your cell phone so in one case with the pencil or the, the mouse pointer you've got really fine grain control and you can carefully tap small elements on the screen and get it right whereas if you're working with your finger you've got a much more coarse pointing element and it's going to be much harder hitting those different targets. So you know, depending upon the actual device we're working with, some designs will work really well and some designs will work pretty badly. And so the question is, how, how, how are we going to respond to this? So one possibility, and this is the basically the way things work for many, many, many years, is that the website designers would just set a minimum standard size and target that. So you know, I've been working on the web since, uh, I guess, around 97 when I came to Stanford. Uh, the web's actually a little bit older than that. Basically, I was working on my PhD. I was finishing my PhD in the last year or two of my PhD. People were like, hey, there's this cool thing called the web. You should check it out. And I was like, no, I'm, I'm busy finishing my uh, dissertation here. And then I worked a couple of years in industry, and then I came to Stanford. And uh, when I took over CS 105, I decided we should be teaching web stuff and so that's when I start working on web technology. Anyway, it's a little aside there. Okay, so the way things worked back in the day and for many years after the web first was introduced was the websites make a decision on what they sort of thought the minimum type of device that people would be visiting their website on. So for a while, websites were designed for devices that were 640 pixels wide or less. Uh, and then they were designed, they sort of upped it and said, okay, we think that people uh, actually have slightly bigger monitors now. So let's go ahead and design our website for people with at least 800 pixel devices. And then they redid their design for 1024 pixel devices. And in fact, you know, every couple of years, the major websites would do another redesign. And the reason why they were doing a redesign is because the monitors that they assumed that people were visiting the websites with were slightly larger. And so they'd, they'd redesign their website for that slightly larger size. And you came to visit their website and you had a smaller monitor. Well, you had to put up with uh, horizontal scroll bars because the website did not actually fit in the amount of space that you had. And if you came to visit that website with a much bigger monitor, well, that's too bad. It was still, you know, stuck on a particular size. So um, that was the original way people designed websites for different devices. Basically, they didn't. 
Okay, another approach that uh, gained a lot of traction and still is out there is the idea that you actually have different websites for different devices. Most notably, there's often a desktop version versus a mobile version. And we can get this because when you make an HTTP request to a website, the web browser actually sends along a bit of information on the user agent. And so what the web server can do is it can look at that user agent and say, oh, I think that this particular user agent should be sent to the desktop version, or this particular user agent should be sent to the mobile version of the website. This also doesn't work great. One, you have to keep an updated list of what all the different user agents are and where they should be sent. And uh, two, it means you're maintaining different multiple websites, one for the desktop and one for mobile. And there are other some, also some other issues. For example, um, I spend a lot of time on my iPad, and it turns out that the iPad often gets shuttled off to the mobile website, which can be pretty problematic if the mobile website's designed for a little cell phone and you've got this nice big screen. And you're like, what the heck, guys? Can I take advantage of my uh, 11 or 13-inch screen? And they're like, no, you're in the mobile website. You're kind of stuck with this. Okay, so these are all unsatisfactory solutions. They've all been done. They've been done professionally. There's a lot of mobile websites out there. And, you know, and I, I, on the one hand, that kind of might make sense in some cases. But on the other hand, you know, I think we're blurring the lines between what's a mobile device, how large is a cell phone, what's a small size tablet, what's a large size tablet, and what's a desktop computer. So there's actually a better approach. And the better approach is something called responsive web design. And so what responsive web design is going to do is it's going to get information about the actual device that the user is using. It's going to ask what the characteristics of that device are, and it's going to have different style rules on the basis of that device. So, you know, this works hand in hand with the cascading style sheets in order to use different cascading style sheet rules for different devices. Um, and as I've alluded to before, this works great with the grid-based layout that I'm recommending you guys learn. All right, so let's take a look at how this might might work. Um, I'm going to start off by kind of giving an overview example. And this is actually the homework assignment for one of my other classes. In fact, this part right here, you all should recognize because this is part of your homework assignment. Um, so, you know, you've all done uh, this this particular assignment here. But uh, what I do for my CS193C class, this is a web development class for our majors that I teach during the summer. I make them change the web design on the basis of what sort of characteristics of the device that are visiting the web page are. So in addition to what you guys have to do, um, when the web page gets narrower and narrower, at some point, it doesn't really make sense to have that counter off to the right side. Um, you can do it, but what's going to happen is that the news article is going to get smaller and smaller. So um, so instead, what we do is we move the calendar below the news article. And then if it gets even narrower, uh, we no longer float the image on one side. Instead, we have the image take up 100% of the width of the uh, web browser window. And then we put the text of the article below it. Um, and then we put the calendar below it. So this is a three-stage design. You can have as many stages as you want. Um, I'm not going to show you the source for this because it is a homework assignment for CS193C, and uh, I don't want the solutions floating around. Uh, okay, so here's an example. Here's one of several examples we're going to take a close look at. Okay, so in this case, I've got a article about the Stanford residence halls, and on the left, I've got a list of all the Stanford residence halls. And so what we're going to do here is we're going to start off by something pretty simple. What we're going to do is, as the web browser window gets narrower, we're just going to go ahead and completely get rid of that uh, list of, of residence halls. Um, OK, so how are we going to do that? It's actually pretty easy. Um, and basically, I'm just going to introduce this concept of a media query. And we're going to talk a little bit about what your options are. Um, you're not actually going to have to do this on any homework assignments, but I did want to kind of give you an idea of how this works. And this is definitely something that if any of you go off and create an actual website, this is definitely something you should be thinking about. Okay, so um, the list of the dorms on the left, that's inside of a nav element. That's one of the new HTML5 se special semantic elements, uh, along with uh, the article and the, I've mentioned the figure and the fig caption before. So there's a nav element. Um, and so... 
that list of dormitories is in the nav element. We're going to see another example a little bit later on that uh, we can actually take a look at the HTML. On. But for now, just, just realize that that list of dormitories is in the nav element. Okay, normally that nav element is floated to the left. And so that's what we're seeing in our uh, left screenshot there. But uh, what I do is I have this media query and I say, hey, if the maximum width of the screen is 480 pixels, in other words, if the screen is 480 pixels or less, then just get rid of that nav element. Just don't display it at all. And so that's what we've got on the right. Okay, so that definitely works. Um, but, you know, for most purposes, you don't want to just get rid of the navigational element. You want to move them. And so that's what our next example is going to do. Um, instead of completely getting rid of the navigational elements, I'm actually going to put them across the top of the screen when the window gets really narrow. Um, and so here's how I'm doing that. Uh, again, I'm, I'm floating the nav to the left. Uh, I've got a media query for a particular width. And so here you can see that um, you can actually have multiple style rules within uh, the media query section. So if the maximum width is 600 pixels or less, uh, then I've got two different rules that are going to apply. First of all, I'm going to get rid of the float on the nav element. And then I'm going to turn all the list items uh, from their standard, which is display block to display inline. And so here on the right, you can see this is the actual HTML. So you can see I've got that nav element. I've got an unordered list. I've got a bunch of list items. And so list items are normally block level elements. Uh, they create blocks of text similar to divs. And so what I'm doing is I'm actually able to change them, their behavior and say, I don't want to treat them as block level elements. I want to treat them as remember what we refer to as inline or text level elements. And those are, are for things, for, for example, we would use for the bold tag or the italics tag. Those were inline or text level elements. And I'm saying, I'm saying hey, I know the, the list item is normally a block, but don't treat it as a block anymore. Just treat it as, a, as just a, a basically a span tag. Um, and so you can see uh, the effect is that the list no longer goes top to bottom. Instead, of the list goes left to right. OK, so here I'm doing this by actually putting the media query directly into the style sheet. Um, there's actually possible to do something similar where you just uh, you use the media query same as before, but you've actually got different cascading style sheet files. And so I just wanted to mention this as a possible, and you can see the syntax here. Um, there's several different ways of doing this. You can use the at import within the style tag itself, or you can create multiple link tags uh, to different uh, cascading style sheet files. Okay, so the last thing I wanted to mention is just to give you a sense of what sort of things we can ask about. So here are some of the uh, sorts of things you might query uh, about in order to determine which set of style sheets or which style rules to use. Um, and there are other ones in addition to these, but I think these are probably the most important. So you can determine what the width and the height of, a, of the user's device is um, or what their window looks like. Uh, you can determine whether their device is in landscape mode or portrait mode. So um, that basically, if, if you're not familiar with the terms, that means whether the person's cell phone is rotated uh, width-wise or, or length-wise. Uh, you can determine what the aspect ratio is. You can determine information about how many colors they're able to uh, display. You can get information about what the screen resolution is, how many dots per inch there are. And so these are all going to determine what sort of uh, look your web page should have um, and what your web page design should look like. There are also a couple more that I think are really interesting. Um, maybe that says something about <laughs> what I find interesting. It says something about me, but... Uh, uh, yeah, I mentioned earlier uh, the idea that depending on whether you're using your finger to select items on a web page or you've got a finer grain pointer like uh, a mouse or a, a, a touch sensitive pen or pencil, um, you might have different web designs. And so you can actually find that information. You can ask, uh, you can use a media query to say, hey, if, if I have a fine grain pointer. I want to use the following elements my web page, or I want my elements to be such and such a size. But if somebody's navigating my web page with their finger, I realize they're not going to be able to tap these things quite as, you know, fine grained. And so maybe I'm going to increase the size of my navigational elements. And then the hover—that's the part where, you know, 
I still really like tool tips, but uh, I certainly acknowledge it does not work at all with with cell phone with somebody trying to navigate with a finger. So you know, we can ask, we can say, does the user have the ability to hover? And if they're using a mouse, then the answer is yes. But if they're using their finger on the cell phone, the answer is no. And so you can change your design on that basis. Anyway, so this whole idea of responding to information about the user's device and using your cascading style sheets to change how the web page appears is, you know, it's really very important if you're planning to do professional design. If you're doing, uh, let's say you end up, uh, you're doing a nonprofit or something and you need to create a web page because nobody else in the nonprofit knows how to create a web page. Um, you can still do some basic web querying. You know, if you go back to that first example I started off with, that's the homework assignment in CS193C, that's actually fairly straightforward saying, hey, I've got a couple breaks where, you know, maybe if the uh, person's monitor is 1,200 pixels or more, let's do this. If the person's monitor is 800 pixels or more, let's do this other thing. That's actually fairly easy. So, you know, if you are planning to create a website, it's definitely something to consider. All right, I'll talk to you all soon.